Good morning, everybody. What is up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, and today we're going to be talking about a Ziegfeld girl. We're going to be talking about Olive Thomas and her unfortunate death. Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz and today we're going to be talking about the death of Olive Thomas, who is another American silent film actress. Her death was very like sudden, kind of sudden. So she was very young, just like Virginia Rapp. She was only 25 at the time of her death and she was really known as being a model, just like Virginia Rapp was, and she moved into film. Now, who is Olive Thomas? Olive Thomas was born in Charleroi, Pennsylvania. Um, her birth name is often claimed as Oliveretta Elaine Duffy, but her most of the things that say her name is Olive R. Duffy. She was the oldest of three children born to her parents, Raina and James Duffy. Both of them were of Irish descent. She had two brothers, James and William. Both of her brothers later would help her when she was in the film industry especially securing work for her. And this is after they would both serve as being in the Marine Corps in France in World War I. Her brother was a cameraman. Um, William was a cameraman. And her brother, James, was an assistant director. So they all kind of like were in the film industry together. And at the time of her death, both of her brothers were employed by uh, Sels Selznick Productions. This is owned by David Selznick, who is best known for producing Gone with the Wind and the movie Rebecca, because he earned an Academy Award for both of them. Now, Olive's father, James, was a steelworker, and unfortunately, he passed away in a work-related accident in 1906. And it's after this his death, they then moved to McKee's Rocks, Pennsylvania, which is a small milling town. Now, Olive and her brothers often would stay with their grandparents while their mom would, would be able to work in a factory that was local. And it's later on where her mother would end up marrying a man named Harry M. Van Kirk, who was also a worker, like a manual laborer, we'll say, because he worked on the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. They went on to have a child, Harriet, who was born in 1914, but unfortunately Harriet would pass away in 1931. So Olive left school at the age of 15, and she did this because she wanted to support her, her siblings. They didn't have a lot of money at the time, and she felt that she needed to help because she was the oldest sibling. So she ended up getting a job and this is where she was selling gingham fabric at uh, Joseph Horn's department store. And this was for about $2.75 a week, which is the equivalent of $79.98 a week in like our time, our money. So it's at when she's the age of 16, she marries a man named Bernard Krug Thomas in McKee's Rocks. This is in April of 1911. And they would only be married for about two years. She would work as a clerk at Kaufman's, which was a giant giant department store in Pittsburgh. And it's after they separate in 1913, this is when she moves to New York City and she lives with a family member there. And while she's there, she ends up working at another department store. So this is where she really like becomes herself and what would be her future self. So in 1914, this is when she enters into a contest called Most Beautiful Girl in New York City. And she ends up winning this contest. Now this is held by Howard Chandler Christie, um, who is a commercial artist. Her winning this contest helped establish her career as an artist's model because she would later then pose for Harrison Fisher, Raphael Kirshner, Perrin Stanlaws, and Haskell Coffin. She was featured on many, many magazines and especially that of Saturday Evening Post. So this isn't the only thing she would do though. She would also go on stage. Harrison Fisher wrote a letter to Florence Ziegfeld Jr. Now, Florence Ziegfeld Jr. is notable in Broadway because he had his theatrical reviews the Ziegfeld Follies, um, which is inspired by Follies Bergere uh, in Paris. Because Harrison Fisher wrote a letter of recommendation for Olive to such an influential person, it resulted in Olive being hired for Ziegfeld Follies. However, Olive did later dispute this, and she said that she just walked right up and asked for a job. So this is kind of like he said, she said type thing. So she ended up making her stage debut in 1950 specifically on June 21st of 1915 for the Ziegfeld Follies. Now she became very popular in this and it led to her being cast in more of Ziegfeld's risque midnight like shows, particularly the Midnight Frolic show 
so this was staged after hours in the like you know people have gardens on their roofs so like the roof garden of a new Amsterdam theater so this show is primarily for just males who had a lot of money that way they could basically throw it at these young female performers kind of like the early former strippers <laughs> or burlesque dancing. It's also rumored that the German ambassador at the time, Albrecht von Berstroff, gave her a string of pearls that was worth $10,000. That's some pricey pearls right there. So during her time at being in the Follies, she would have an affair with Ziegfeld. Now, here's the thing. Ziegfeld is married. He's married to a fellow actress named Billy Burke, who was also a famous actress of Broadway and in radio and also in silent films and regular films. She is mostly known as Glinda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz. So that's his wife. But he didn't just have an affair with Olive. He had an affair with all the other Ziegfeld girls, including Lillian Lorraine and Marilyn Miller, who later went on to marry Olive's widower, Jack Pigford. So Olive ended her relationship with Ziegfeld because he refused to leave Billy Burke and marry her. So she would continue modeling with and appearing in the Follies, and she would start to be painted by different artists. So there was an artist in residence. His name is Alberto Vargas, and he painted many of the women on stage. And he painted Olive, which is called Memory of Olive Thomas or the Lotus Eater, which this is a gorgeous painting. You have to really, really like and understand the beauty behind art to really get past the nudity of it. So he painted this in memory of her after she passed away. And basically it depicts her from waist up and she's holding one breast with her left hand and she has a rose in her right that's that's raised upright to her face where it looks like she's going to eat it. This remained in Alberto Vargas's personal collection until 1982 and then it was sold to a private collector in 86. Um, Alberto said that she was one of the most beautiful brunettes that Ziegfeld ever glorified or ever had. So in July of 1916, this is when she signs with the International Film Company. She makes her on-screen debut in episode 10 of Beatrice Fairfax, which is a just a series of films that was put together. It was first released in August on August 7th of 1916, and it consisted of 15 episodes. So in 1917, this is when she made her full-length movie debut in A Girl Like That for Paramount. That same year, she went on to sign with Triangle Pictures, but shortly after, the news broke of her engagement to Jack Pigford, um, whom she had married at basically a year prior. So Thomas and Jack. Now Jack was the younger brother of Mary Pickford. Now Mary Pickford was also a Canadian American film actress and she was a producer. They kept their marriage a secret because Olive didn't want people to think that her success in film was due to her association with the family. Now her first film tr for Triangle was called Madcap Match and it was released in June of 1917. And her popularity at Triangle grew, uh, especially with with their performances in Indiscreet Corinne and uh, Limousine Life. Now in 1919, she went on to play a French girl that posed as a boy in Totten the Apache. I think that's what it's called, Totten the Apache. And she later said that she felt her work in um, Totten was the first thing she ever really did. She made her final film for a Triangle called Follies Girl that same year. Now, when she left uh, triangle pictures. She went on to sign with Myron Zels Zelsnick uh, for the Zelsnick Pictures Company in 1918 for a salary about 2500 a week, which is quite the bit of money in that time. Um, she had hoped for more serious roles because she wanted to be taken seriously. And she believed that with her husband being signed with the same company, she would have more of an influence. However, her first film for the company would be Upstairs and Down, which ended up being successful and it really established her image as a baby vamp. She was very pale and she had darker hair, so she really looked as to being like more of like the macabre look. Um, she also followed this with roles in Love's Prisoner and Out Yonder. Both came out in 1919. Now, she would end up going on to play in the movie called The Flapper, which came out in the 1920s. She played a teenage schoolgirl who really wants to enjoy life outside of her small Florida town. Now, this is the first time she was able to portray a lead character who was a flapper and it's the first film and the first of its kind to portray this lifestyle of 
flappers. I mean, they're in the 1920s. The 1920s was known as the Roaring Twenties. And this is the first movie that really, really put what was happening in life to the forefront so other people could see it. So Frances Marion, who wrote the whole scenario, she was a screenwriter for this. She was responsible for bringing this term to the Americans. Nobody had heard of the term flapper before. Nobody had heard of it. And thank you, Frances Marion, for doing this. Now, The Flapper became one of her most successful films. It Olive was really known for this film. And on October 4th of 1920, her final film, which is called Everybody's Sweetheart, came out. Now, like I mentioned, she was married to Bernard Krug Thomas. Now, she met him when she was about 15, when they lived in Pennsylvania. She went on to marry him in 1911, but then they separated in 1913. She was granted a divorce from him on September 25th of 1915 on grounds of desertion and cruelty. So he would end up being interviewed by the Pittsburgh Press in 1931, and he talked about his marriage to Olive. And he implied that the cause of their marriage dissolving is because of her ambition and her desire to obtain a life of luxury and to improve her stature, basically, which is not something that he would be able to do as what he was doing. I mean, they worked in mill towns. They worked in factories. You can make a good living off of working in a factory. Trust me. I know. But so in 1916, this is when she meets her husband, Jack. Um, and I already mentioned that he was a brother of one of the most successful silent film stars, Mary Pickford. They met on the Santa Monica Pier, specifically in a beach cafe. So both of them, both of them were highly known for their partying. Like they often were seen at the Pickford home and they were really like wild. So Frances Marion said that she often saw Olive at the Pickford home and where she would be engaged with Jack. And both of them were innocent looking children. They were very like wild who stirred up the stardust in Broadway. They were very talented and they were very much interested in playing with the roulette in life. And they really were concentrated more on that than their careers. So they went on to elope. October 25th of 1916 in, in New Jersey. None of the family was present. The only witness was an actor, Thomas Mahan. They never had any children, although in 1920, they went on to adopt Olive's six-year-old nephew, which is the son of one of her brothers. And they went on to adopt him after his mother died. Because at the time, if the mother passes away, father is not supposed to take care of him. That's how it was back then. Don't fight me on this. Because I have an actual family representation of this. Because, yes. Most accounts say that Jack was the love of Olive's life. And that their marriage was very tumultuous. It was highly charged with conflict. But they made up with each other with lavish gifts. And, like... That was how they bought each other's love, basically. It sounds really disgusting, but it's true. So his family didn't approve of Olive most of the time. But most of the family did attend her funeral. And in Mary's autobiography, Sunshine and Shadow, she wrote that she regrets to say that um, none of them approved the marriage at the time. Her mother, Charlotte Hennessy, um, thought Jack was a little too young. And Lottie, which is Charlotte, and I felt that Olive being from musical musical comedy belonged to a different world. She wasn't a part of their world. Ollie had all the rich and eligible men of the sociable world at her feet, but she deluged with pr uh, proposals from her own world in theater as well, uh, which isn't surprising. Now, her beauty was legendary, and she was the loveliest violet blue-eyed girl she'd ever seen. Um, that were fringed with long, long dark eyelashes that made it more prominent because her, her skin was so fair. She also said that she could understand why Florence Ziegfeld never forgave Jack for taking her away from the Follies, um, it, but she and Jack were madly in love with one another. But she always thought of them as a couple of children playing together. So again, this there's that thought of them just being like young kids and not really like growing up. So for several years, her and Jack intended on taking a vacation together. They were constantly traveling and had little time together. And their marriage was really on the rocks by the time they decided to take their second honeymoon. So in August of 1920, they headed to Paris. And they hoped for a vacation that they could really like 
spend time with one another. So on the night of September 5th of 1920, they went out for the evening, partying at famous bistros on the Matropasse in a specific area of Paris. They then returned to their suite at the Ritz um, Hotel at 3 a.m. So Jack either fell asleep or was outside of the bedroom. Now, Olive was highly intoxicated and she was very tired. She then ingested mercury bichloride. Now, mercury bichloride is highly toxic, but it was a topical medication that could have been prescribed to Jack to treat sores. That was because of his syphilis. So, many different accounts speculate what happened. Now, she they believe she thought that it was a flask that was containing water or some type of tonic and medications label was in French which may have kind of like caused her more confusion because she can't speak or read French. Now after she drank the liquid it's apparently when she said oh my god and this is when Jack rushed to her side. She was then taken to an American hospital in the suburb of neuilly sur seine in Paris where Jack and his ex-brother-in-law Owen Moore remained at Olive's side until she died five days later. While she was lying in the hospital the press began to swarm around. There was papers that reported she attempted suicide after having a fight with Jack over his infidelities, while others say that she attempted suicide after discovering he had syphilis. Now, there's rumors that Olive was plagued by a drug addiction and that she and Jack were involved in champagne and cocaine orgies at the time, um, or that she was tricked into drinking the poison in an attempt to murder her for insurance money. Now, Owen Moore, who accompanied them to the hospital and in Paris, denied any of these rumors and said that she was not suicidal and that she and Jack didn't fight that evening. Jack also said that him and Olive were the greatest pals and that her death was a ghastly mistake. So on September 13th of 1920, this is when Jack gives his account of the evening. He says that they arrived back at the hotel room at three in the morning. He had already booked the airplane seats for London. Um, they were going Sunday morning. Both of them were tired. Both of them had drinking a little and insisted that we better not pack then but get up early for a trip and then do it. He went to bed immediately. And Olive apparently fussed around and wrote a note to her mother. She was in the bathroom at the time. Suddenly, she, she yelled, my God. He jumped out of bed and then rushed to her and caught her in his arms. She then cried and basically about, like, cried about what is in the bottle. And he picked it up and read poison. It was a toilet solution and the label was in French. He then realized what she had done and sent for the doctor. Um, he then forced forced her to drink water in order to make her vomit. She screamed, oh my God, I'm poisoned. She then had white egg whites forced down her throat, hoping to offset the poison. So uh, the doctor then came and he pumped her stomach three times while Jack held her. So it's about nine in the morning when they get to the hospital and doctors Chote and Wharton took care of her. They told her, told him that she swallowed bichloride of mercury in an alcoholic solution, which is 10 times worse than tablets, and that she didn't want to die. She took the poison by mistake. They both loved each other since the day where they were married, and the fact that they were separated months at a time made no difference. Uh, she was conscious enough the day before she died to ask for a nurse to come to America with her until she fully recovered, uh, because she didn't think she was going to die. So after Olive's death, the police investigated and an autopsy was performed, and her death was attributed to acute nephritis, which, is ca which was caused by by mercury bichloride absorption. Um, her death was ruled accidental on September 13th of 1920 by the Paris physician that conducted her autopsy. So nephritis basically is an inflammation of the kidneys um, that involve basically your whole kidneys inflamed and it's very painful. So Jack brought all his body back to the United States. And there are several different accounts that say that he tried to commit suicide on the way back, but was talked out of it, talked out of it. Now, in Mary's autobiography, it says that he made an attempt during return trip. Now, she Mary says that Jack crossed the ocean with Olive's body, and it wasn't until several several years later that he confessed to their mother that one night in the voyage, he put on his trousers and jacket over his pajamas, went on deck and was climbing over the rail and Something inside of him said, you can't do this to your mother and sisters. It's cowardly. And you must live and face the future. So Olive's funeral would be held 
at the St. Thomas Episcopal Church in New York City. And there was hundreds of fellow actors or other invited attendees and basically a horde of curious people watching. Several women were reported to have fainted during this. Um, And several men had their hats crushed in like the rush to view her casket. Now, Olive is interred in a crypt at the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, and it's in the Pickford Crypt. Now, she didn't have a will during her death, and her estate was later valued at $27,644, which is the equivalent of $370,000 in 2021, which would be split between her mother and her two brothers. Yeah, all this money would be split between her mother, her two brothers, and her husband. Now, Jack later relinquished his right to a portion of the money, and he chose to give it to Olive's mother instead. Now, November 22nd of 1920, a lot of her personal property was auctioned off in an estate sale, um, which basically was the equivalent of $30,000 for everything that that was uh, sold. So Louis Selznick bought Olive's town car for an undisclosed amount as well. Mabel Normand, who is also involved in another murder, which we'll we'll get into in another video. Um, she bought a 20 piece toilet set and the 14 karat gold cigarette case and three pieces of jewelry, which included a sapphire pin of olives. So there was a ton of press coverage, ton of press coverage when it came to this murder, because during this time, there was a lot of other murders that happened. William Desmond Taylor, which is another one I'm going to cover that happened in 1922. Then there is a drug related death of Wallace Reed. Then there's the fatty Arbuckle trial in 1921, which includes Virginia Rapp, which is another video that I will have already gone live or will go go live. There's a lot of scandalous murders that happened in Hollywood, especially earlier on in Hollywood's basically like uprising that a lot of people don't realize actually has happened. So that's the point, basically the point of why I'm doing these videos this month is so people realize Hollywood's not just about glitz and glam. It's also about the murders that take place surrounding the celebrities and people in that limelight. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments down below. But that, my friends, is the suspicious death of Olive Thomas. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you guys in another video. Bye, you guys.